Church, it's an exciting day. We're going to kick off a series, a sermon series, about the life of Joseph called Meant for Good. And throughout the series, we're going to explore seven broader Christian principles for living that we can draw from Joseph's life in the book of Genesis. And these principles are represented by the seven Ps. These Ps are promise, process, perfection, procession, penitence, provision, and peace. Today, we'll begin to explore the Christian life and aim to challenge some preconceived notions that many people have about Christianity, especially in the United States. By doing so, I believe we will discover some amazing truths about the first part of Joseph's story in the Bible. So I want to start with a few misconceptions about God and our faith in him that need to be challenged. Maybe you have heard about these things or you have these thoughts or feelings in your life when you think about God or your relationship with God. Thoughts like, if God loves me, he will make my life relatively easy and comfortable. Or maybe God's primary goal for me in my life is to make me feel good. Or how about if I'm suffering, it means God doesn't love me. You may hear these statements and think to yourself, self, of course these aren't true. However, it's our human nature to default to selfish ways of thinking, even in matters of faith. Many, or might I say maybe all of us, have fallen victim to such thoughts at some point in our lives. Can you recall a time when you were disappointed or even angry at God for allowing bad things to happen to you or things that happen to you that you think are unfair? Like I said, I'm sure that we can re- all, all relate in some level. Our culture has taught us a worldview that says that things should go well for us. We are more addicted to convenience than any generation before us. If we are hungry, we go to the store or we pop something in the microwave. If we're thirsty, we turn on the faucet or we crack open a drink. If we need something, many of us tap on our computer or phone app and then it arrives at our door in a few hours. In some ways, this is awesome. But in a sense of entitlement for things to be easy and convenient, it can put us into a conflict with God's ways of dealing with us, which often involve suffering and waiting. The concept that God's love equates to convenience contradicts the realities illustrated throughout the scripture. God is more concerned about shaping our character than ensuring our comfort. The trials faced by Joseph, a devoted servant of God, serve as a valuable case study of God's real work in our lives. So I will frame this as promise, process, perfection, uh, procession, provision, and peace. These six Ps outline God's intention toward us. Promise. His, uh, his, His work in our lives, including suffering, is the process, and what What that work is producing is perfection. And they also explain our journey, which is procession, and how God provides a way is provision, and our ultimate reconciliation with God is peace. So today we're going to begin with the discussion, the promise, and the process. We're going to be in Genesis chapters 37, verses 1 through 6. Uh, It is found on page 34 in your Old Testament scripture. Uh, You can follow along on the slides, or uh, you can uh, follow along in in your Bible, but listen to God's word for us today. We're going to start with uh, Genesis 37, verses 1 through 4. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan, and these are descendants of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers, and he was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah and his father's wives and Joseph uh, his, his father's wives and Joseph brought a bad report to them to their father now Israel aka Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his children because he was the son of his old uh, of his old age and he made him an ornamented robe 
But when his brothers saw that their father loved them more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, Joseph is just 17 years old, and he is experiencing significant turmoil within his family. His father clearly favors him. It's his favorite child. He's the youngest child. I can relate. I'm the youngest child, and I'm the favorite child of my parents. And my youngest child is the favorite child of my wife and I. Even though we don't tell our children that, they know. And so this has caused a deep resentment with his brothers. So Joseph's habit of reporting on his brothers further deepens the tensions of resentment. This family is in a fragile state and on the verge of exploding, and Joseph's two prophetic dreams are about to intensify the situation. In verse 5, it says, Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him. They hated him even more. And he said to them, listen, to this dream that I dreamed, there, there were binding sleeves, uh, sleeves, sheaves on the field, and suddenly the sheaf rose and stood upright, and then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to them, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. He had another dream and told it to his brothers. You think that he kind of learned from that first time? He's saying, look, I've heard another dream. The sun, the moon, the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what kind of dream is this that, that you had? Shall we indeed come and I and your mother and your brothers and bow down to the ground before you? So his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. In Joseph's time, dreams were often understood as being prophetic. And many of his ancestors from, uh, ancestors from Abraham to Jacob had dreams that were truly from God and represented God's actual communication with them. So it's not strange that Joseph's fathers and their brothers, hearing these dreams that Joseph had, they assume that he's talking about a future reality not something that they can just discard and say, you're just full of it. So when Joseph tells his family about the dream, what is his posture? Joseph knows that his father favors him over his brothers, and he knows that his brothers resent him for this because of the way they speak to him. But still, Joseph tells them, hey, guess what? One day, you're all going to bow down to me, and, and then he does this twice. What could go wrong? I think it's easy to say that Joseph is pretty excited about the prospect of his dream, that he feels compelled to share it publicly in a way that can't help but sound like he's just bragging. Even his father tells him that he needs to stop talking. The remarkable thing is that Joseph's dream is actually a promise from God. This prophecy will undoubtedly come true one day, and Joseph is truly hearing from God through his dreams. However, Joseph only seems to see the positive aspect of the promise and does not, see, does not fully realize the sacrifices that will be required to bring about the events of the promise. Now, it's important for Joseph to consider the potential challenges and prepare himself for the sacrifices that will be necessary to fulfill this promise. In the same, same way, I think we often focus only on the promises of God, especially when we're new to the faith. And when we focus only on the promises of God, we fail to realize that, uh, that God's process for fulfilling these promises often involves suffering or sacrifice. We desire the promise without being willing to go through the process. And this can lead to us wrestling with God, holding him responsible, and even turning away from him when we go through those hard times. The Apostle Paul understands this when he writes to the Roman Christians in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, when he says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. 
And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into the hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul knows that God's promise and hope of salvation through Jesus Christ will come with their suffering and their, uh, that they are experiencing. It's the process. The process that produces endurance, which strengthens our character and leads to hope and faith. Now, Joseph has his problems with his brothers, but his father, Jacob, he doesn't help the situation. Because after all this, he tells Joseph, go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring word back to me. So after all of this and telling Joseph that he needs to close his mouth and stop bragging, he tells him, by the way, could you go out to the field and spy on your brothers and make sure they're doing what they need to be doing? And things just get worse after there, because, especially for Joseph, because his brothers see him. In verse 18, so the brothers saw Joseph from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we shall say to the, uh, to a, that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will come of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe and the ornamental, uh, ornamented robe that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Here's a great example that shows the impact of dwelling on negative emotions, such as hatred and jealousy. It shows how our thoughts and emotions can influence our actions. The story of Joseph and his brothers emphasizes the importance of thinking positively and constructively. And it's a reminder of the power and the role of grace in overcoming challenging situations in our lives. For all of Joseph's perceived faults, he has done nothing to deserve the cruelty that his brothers planned. But Joseph must go through everything he does to ultimately see and experience God's blessings. And this begins a road of suffering and exile that will last for decades. And this is God's ordained process for Joseph in order to bring blessings not just for him, but his family and for his people, the nation of Israel, that will endure for generations. In order to fully experience God's promise, we must be willing to endure the suffering and the hardships. This process molds us into individuals with character needed to genuinely serve others and fulfill God's calling in our lives. Becoming a Christian means committing to be transformed into the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And this transformation inevitably involves experiencing suffering just as Jesus did and the other handful of individuals that have endured in Scripture. So what happens next? Verse 23, Then Joseph's brother sat down to eat, and looking up they saw a caravan of uh, Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brothers and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother. He's our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. I mean, that sounds a lot better, right? Okay, what does it profit us if we kill him? 
So what we're going to do is, you know, we're just going to take them out and then we're going to sell them because that's better. We can get money from him. We're good brothers. We're not going to kill him. We'll just make money off of him and just sell him into slavery. Imagine this emotional scene of Joseph pleading, crying out to his brothers not to sell him, but they do it anyway. Despite God giving Joseph a promise through a dream of a glorious destiny, his journey begins with hardship. And Joseph will ultimately rise to become second in command of Egypt, one of the most powerful men in the world, with his brothers and father bowing down to him. However, with such a promise of exaltation, could Joseph have ever imagined that this would be the road to getting there? being sold into slavery, hated and nearly murdered by his brothers, thrown into a dark pit, and ultimately sold to strangers and kidnapped away to a strange land. The tension between God's promise and his process can feel incredibly jarring at times, causing a sense of contradiction. As people of faith, uh, we hold on to precious promises, but we also must understand and accept God's process, which may include moments of pain and difficulty. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, that we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work for good. But during the storms in our lives, we don't perceive them as God's blessings. We don't see them as good. We are often totally unprepared for the suffering involved in the process and perceive it as God's judgment, which can lead some to lose their faith or even question their faith. However, stories like Joseph serve as a powerful reminder of God's ability to sustain us through the most difficult circumstances in our lives. If you are currently navigating a challenging process and finding it hard to reconcile, uh, reconcile it with, loving, with a loving God, know that many have experienced similar feelings. We cry out to God, even being angry with God, screaming at him. And it's okay to be honest about these struggles and remember that God is with us, even in the midst of our toughest times. And God is big enough to hear our cries and our anger and our disappointment. We grapple with this tension. And while we're in this tension, we also need to pray that the Spirit of God will equip and comfort us. Only God himself can give you the power to embrace his process. But rest assured that God has a plan, just as he has a plan, had a plan for Joseph all along. In fact, in, Joseph, in Joseph's case, God had planned all this beforehand for the rescue and deliverance of Israel on a grand scale. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 105, verse 16 through 19, when they wrote, when he summoned famine against the land, when God summoned famine against the land and cut off every supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who had been sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with, with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. Until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord kept testing him. God kept testing Joseph. Joseph's story goes beyond his own life. It's the rescue of his entire family and the preservation of an entire nation. And I, I find it meaningful when the psalmist writes, the word of the Lord tested him. Being tested means that you're being refined like metal smelted in a furnace. The word of God tested Joseph, and the promise of God tested him, molding him into something new. God is shaping you and I right now 
through all of the suffering and struggles that we, we, that we experience, God is transforming us and our situation into something precious and amazing that couldn't be achieved without pr great pressure and cost. Do we understand what it means to be tested by a promise? It means that we must live within the tension between the promise and the process. If we can hold that tension by the grace of God, we will ultimately be able to accept God's way of dealing with us, even if his ways are sometimes painful and uncomfortable. The story, uh, story tells of the journey of a brother who overcame adversity, an outsider who found resilience, a slave who gained freedom, a convict who found redemption, and a ruler who became a savior to those who wronged him. And it's a powerful narrative of betrayal, forgiveness, and ultimate redemption. Joseph's story is a reflection of Christ and the Christian experience. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll explore how this story can provide insights into understanding and cooperating with God's guidance in our lives. And as we reflect in our lives, we may find that these promises don't always align with our experiences. And it's a natural question how these promises can coexist with the difficulties that we face. We might wonder, how can a loving God allow this to be taken from me? Or how can a loving God withhold this from us? And this is the tension between the promise and the process. The tension is not only normal, but also as much of a promise as any of the promises. Listen to the promise that Jesus gives us in John chapter 16, verse 33, when he says, I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. Can you feel the tension in what Jesus is saying? You are going to suffer a lot. But cheer up and have peace because I have already won the victory. You just can't see it yet. We are becoming a people like Joseph with the actual ability to be cheered up and illuminated by a promise, by the very words of God in the midst of an utterly contradictory experience. This is what it means to our faith to be purified and strengthened. What refined Joseph during the decades of his humiliation, terror, and torment was the word of God. The time strengthened his faith. That's all he had in the pit. That's all he had in the slave line. That's all he had in the prison. The very word of God and the promise that was given to him. So how do we endure the process? The unendurable process. Only by holding fast to the promise that God has for us. And by extension, this means holding fast to the very word of God. Listen to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. For the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. I fall, but I get back up. That is the mark of the righteous. We fall, but we rise again through Christ. I'm sure that you have cherished scripture passages that you often turn to in times of struggle. And I will tell you to hold on to them. Hold on to them in your heart. Recite them over and over again because those are the promises that you have and that God has given you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never give you anything else that you cannot handle. Just because you have lost hope yesterday, it doesn't mean that you can't find hope today or tomorrow. 
Similarly, even if you lose hope tomorrow, you can regain it the following day. This is the essence of the process. Every day, you are being tested and refined by the Word of God. Although you may believe that you're holding on to God, the truth is that God is holding on to you. We find God's promises in Scripture and let it speak through our souls to reign our footing in life when we feel like we've stumbled. Now, I hope that this sermon doesn't bring you down, but rather helps you to comprehend your Christian journey with its highs and its lows, with its ebbs and its flows. So remember that God knows exactly what he's doing in your life. He has a plan. He will fulfill his promise in your life, and he will support you through the process. But you need to hold to God, hold on to God tightly, and know that you are always in his grace and his love. Let us pray. God, there are times in our lives where we struggle. We are in pain. We are in suffering for the loss of loved ones, for the loss of job, for the not understanding our future, for the confusion of life, for the things that are hard. It's not that things that we we ask for or, or the luxuries or things like that, but things that just hurt our heart and we struggle in life. But let us be reminded that you are there in the midst of the struggle. The struggle is present because it is the process to be refined, to let go of the things that truly don't belong in our lives, that help us, that make us lose focus on you. Refine us, O oh God, and what is left, let it be pure. Let it be pure so that we may focus on you and you alone, that we may hear the only voice which is yours, and that by doing so, by hearing the word of God, that we may fulfill that promise that you have given us in our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.